All right. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us on uh, today's edition of uh, Conversation with Reopened Gyms. Um, we've got a couple great gyms with us today and uh, excited for all of your questions as well. Um, as we do for every call, start with a little bit of an agenda so you know what to expect, and um, we'll cover the tool we're using Zoom. Uh, we'll cover some basic ground rules. I'm going to give you guys a little overview of the reopening survey um, from last month that we just uh, finalized and give you a preview of what's to come um, as we move forward with uh, reopening and uh, learning more about uh, some of the best practices that we can all employ as we reopen. Um, and then uh, we'll jump right into our panel discussion that um, uh, that we have um, our panelists with. And you guys can chat and um, use that question and answer tool to uh, have discussions and get the questions to uh, myself and our panelists. Um, once we get to the question and answer section, you can feel free to raise your hand as well and I can unmute you and uh, give you a chance to say anything that you'd like to um, that's a little bit longer than a, a normal chat or typed message. Um, our ground rules, as always, will be to be polite and respectful um, to each other. If we do unmute you, keep any comments to about two minutes or so so that everyone has a chance to speak. And for this discussion, we'll you know, be keeping any personal political commentary out of it. should be um, pretty uh, uh, focused on which what happens in the gym anyway. And um, any, anyone who is abusive or disruptive will have to remove you. Luckily, we've never had to do that yet, so uh, that streak, I'm sure, will continue on today's call. Um, to start with, I was gonna, like I said, uh, give you an, a little glimpse of what we had um, just uh, published around our reopening survey. And this is just a chance to see what different gyms are doing. Um, and uh, our plan is to continuously monitor the situation with the uncertainty around what rules exist, what rules might change and when they might change. Um, and, uh, just the need to continuously monitor the situation as we learn more and uh, best practices change. Uh, we'll be doing these surveys pretty regularly. We decided to do them monthly right now. Uh, and um, if there's any changes to that uh, cadence, we'll definitely let you know. Um, you can access the full results of that survey at um, a dashboard that we made for it at climbingwallindustry.org slash May reopening dashboard. Um, there's links to that uh, on our site and in our newsletter as well, uh, as well as an article that we just published um, earlier in our last edition of the newsletter that covers a lot of um, a lot of the different results for this call. I was just going to throw a couple of the um, charts up for you guys, and this is around some of the most commonly asked questions we get on these calls. So just to give you an idea of where um, many of the people in the industry are, uh, and and this survey. Uh, you know, has respondents from around the world. So uh, it's, it's a pretty broad uh, cross-section of, of different gyms of different sizes. It is almost uh, exclusively uh, commercial climbing gyms. There aren't a lot of other um, institutions or facilities um, in this survey. So, uh, you know, as you, as you can see on the screen here, I thought one of the things that was um, pretty interesting uh, as a result is in the initial reopening, uh, and keep in mind this survey was done um, back in er, uh, in uh, in late May, um, so this is right as some gyms had already started to open. Some very few gyms had been open for about um, about a month, um, and uh, the results for this survey about a quarter of the gyms had been reopened. Uh, so some of these results are people who are putting these uh, policies into practice, and some of these results are of what people were planning to do as they reopened or as they, as they were looking to reopen. Um, and I thought it was pretty interesting that uh, really early on during the closures, there was a lot of discussion around rental gear and, um, you know, how people were going to handle that. And it turns out that um, at least as of uh, late May, it, it looks like other than uh, chalk bags, most rental gear operations were probably going to be pretty, pretty similar to um, uh, what, what was happening before, uh, before the closures and before the pandemic. I'm, a couple different uh, remediary steps to help manage rental gear, but no, by and large, people weren't, um, you know, flocking to just force people to climb with their own uh, equipment. Um, another interesting uh, uh, bit of data from this survey was around uh, chalk. Another, um, you know, really common question on these calls. 
And, um, you know, the, by far, it seemed like the strongest uh, instinct that people had and the, and the, and the strongest policy or the most common policy was to recommend liquid shock, but not um, limit or force people not to use regular shock. Um, and as we've learned in you know, previous calls uh, that we've had together and then a lot of individual calls I've had with gyms. I, I think one of the, you know, biggest portions of reasoning around that is uh, just the difficulty of, of roped climbing and especially lead climbing uh, with liquid shock. Um, so we'll, uh, you know, as I said, we'll keep launching these surveys and we'll see how gym policies evolve, either harden up or soften up over time. Um, I, I would anticipate um, you know, one of the things we'll see a change in is around mask usage. So this uh, graph that I just sur surfaced is, um, you know, talking about mask policies that gyms were enacting uh, in uh, late May again. And, um, you know, th I think there's been uh, some interesting changes in the, in the national conversation here in the States anyway. <laughs> a lot of other countries are, are have, have, a, have a bit more um, consistent policy there, uh, either over time or just over different uh, geographies in those countries. Um, so where, where we stood, um, you know, back in late May was that most gyms were going to be uh, requiring their customers to wear masks, even if they didn't have any sort of local ordinance. And um, then there's a good chunk of gyms, you know, about a fifth of gyms uh, who uh, just have to require masks uh, due to their local um, ordinances. So as, as we, um, you know, uh, go forward, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing these surveys on a monthly basis. And uh, we just launched uh, the June version of this survey. So uh, you, should see, you should have seen links to that in the newsletter if you um, have read that already. Um, if you haven't, please, um, you know, take some time to take that survey. It's pretty quick. Um, and you can, you can access that survey at climbingwallindustry.org slash reopening survey. Um, so let's jump into uh, the reason we're, we're all here, which is to hear um, some experiences from uh, gyms that have reopened. Uh, on the call today, we have uh, uh, Tilde Bombardo Moore from Whetstone Climbing Gym here in Colorado in the Front Range. Uh, and uh, we also have Lauren Watson from Ground Up out of uh, BC up in Canada. Um, uh, these guys both have some really interesting um, uh, and, and, and somewhat unique experiences uh, reopening. Uh, Whetstone uh, was featured in a climbing magazine article uh, around what it was like to um, get back into the climbing gym and, and how awesome and comfortable it was, um, which is great. And, uh, and Lauren has some experience uh, working really closely with uh, other gyms in BC and then also talking pretty directly and openly with um, with their local public health authorities. And uh, I, I think that's uh, worked out really well for, for that group of gyms in, in that area. So without further ado, uh, we'll jump in and I, I'll start with, um, with Tilde, if you don't mind kicking us off and I'll let you just give a little brief overview of, yeah, what your whole experience has been like and where you guys are at now. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so right now we are uh, a month today in the reopening. And um, so the article that you mentioned uh, from the Never Post was definitely to highlight the fact that climbing industry concede that there is no way to keep walls disinfected. Right, that was the whole point. And that the focus will be on a good hygiene principle by climbers to prevent spread. So, and that's something uh, that was highlighted in the article. Um, but the experience overall um, of being a month reopening has been challenging because we have definitely not figured out everything in terms of uh, where the programs are going to be or other area in department so we still trying to figure it out uh, what our yoga programs look like or uh, other department but overall it's been a learning experience because we started with the, the pre-registrations and right now we are not doing pre-registration anymore. Um, we are definitely using the new uh, checkout system, check-in and check-out, the RGP uh, feature uh, lately. Uh, and so far it's been pretty good. Uh, and that 
decompress the stress of having people pre-register for it. Um, so we were not allowing um, gears, but then uh, now the harness and shoes are available to rent. So, and we switch uh, the days, we alternate um, the days of the, the harness they get used. Um, so, let's see what else. Um, do you have anything that specific you would like me to highlight? Yeah, well, and yeah, that, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, you mentioned the Denver Post article as well. And then I was, I was also thinking about the article uh, that Matt Samet wrote in Climbing um, about his experience. Uh, that was interesting if you got any feedback from either your members or, or other people in the community around, um, around those articles. Uh, no, not specifically. No, I have to say it didn't create um, much as a feedback from the members. Uh, no. Okay. Well, it was, it was a great bit of uh, press for the industry as a whole, I think, to uh, <laughs> counter some of the uh, uh, the more troubling articles that have that have come out um, over the last few months. So, um, yeah. hopefully, that that strikes a nerve with uh, all of our customers out there. Um, on, on, you know, on that note, uh, how how have how have your members been returning to the gym? Are you seeing um, what you would have expected? Uh, Maybe not this time of year, but as you reopened and, and had plans to um, serve a certain uh, number? Yes, I guess the numbers are definitely lower than expected uh, to the fact that we reopened into the summer season, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we had great um, feedback uh, from our customers. Um, I guess... Uh, um, no, we are very happy about how the reopening went. We mm -hmm. definitely didn't expect that was this positive. So we were able to do well, even with our promotions of our summer pass for new members. So we are getting new members as well. Oh. So, and that's very encouraging. Um, so um, definitely you can say that people, members of the climbing gym and doing activities in, indoor, not everybody's comfortable. And there are a bunch of questions that come out like, oh, maybe you should close the fan. The fans are on, it helps the distribution of the coronavirus. While we think keeping the fan on and the hair flow, it's better. Or, so definitely uh, that it will be, the, the, the challenge is to re-educate, re-educate your members to a different experience yeah. um, and that's for for the staff is the same right um, so definitely the training of our staff is something that we focus very much and uh, so far has been good so right. so far nobody called us and said hey I was exposed what you gonna do now I was at the gym didn't happen yet so but definitely we are afraid of it so right. And uh, so it sounds like your customers have uh, been pretty comfortable uh, following all of the policies. Have you had any trouble with people not wanting to wear masks or? Um, so you know? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that um, I bring you examples that way it's more clear. Uh, we had some people yesterday they came in, they are high risk and they want to make sure we walk around to the gym to make sure everyone was wearing masks the whole time. So as you, as the language that we use for reopening is that, I want to read exactly what Vladimir County said specifically, is that a uh, face covering must be worn by all employing customer when entering, entering the facility, but customer might remove face covering if and when it inhibits their ability to participate in the fitness activities. So that was, you know, a little bit challenging because some people say, oh yeah, I will remove it. But that's not what the language says. So every time people put their feet on the ground, they have to put the masks. Uh, we definitely increase announcement of talking over the microphone, the speakers to remind people, like friendly reminder about putting your mask back. And that has been helping. Um, some people are you know, more worried than others. But we had a few complaints, right? That, hey, you're 
people in the gym were not wearing masks. There was this person not wearing masks. But there is also a lot of space uh, between right now, uh, between people. So we are working with 75, which is 15% uh, of our capacity, which is very, very low. We can go up to uh, 50 per, uh, 30 percent or something like that but we are not doing that so just for the pros perspective we want people to feel more comfortable so going below what the guidelines says i think helps people to feel like you are doing something extra for your members yeah, yeah and i think uh i think that's been uh one of the really hard but really bright spots of um, seeing gym policies and uh, you know, using some of the tools that we provided from the CWA as well. Uh, every time I've heard gyms have to have a discussion around capacity with uh, health authorities and, and around reopening, uh, that's always been looked upon really favorably, that extra step of caution that uh, all you yeah. guys are taking. Um, I think that's been a really good tool for the industry. And you can always go up <laughs> as, as things get better eventually, hopefully. <laughs> so I definitely advise that right now, if you're trying to change anything, right? If you open and you say, I'm going to keep it 75, or I'm going to keep it whatever number it is, uh, I think you, we have to think of the fall. And what it means when numbers are going to start to increase, right? When people are coming back so the, the 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 people that froze in membership for summer are coming back so uh we also said that my pre-registration are coming back right so um so overall we had um members feedback were all positive and we were able to understand better what how to work around the members and to make them comfortable um and so far it's been good i have to say that it's been less difficult than what i was we, what we were thinking oh that's great to hear uh, you know for people who haven't had a chance to visit whetstone yet um <laughs> uh, anyone who wasn't with us at the summit last year um you, your gym's pretty large and you've got a couple of really distinct areas that um uh you know kids areas and bouldering areas things are distinct are you treating uh, all those different sections as different zones with different capacity limits, or are you doing a full gym capacity? Uh, we are doing the full gym capacity, and overall, we are putting trust in people to keep their distance, right? Uh, and so far, it's been good. So we put we put um, signages on the, only on the walls to give them perspective of the six feet. So little square with the stay six feet from each other. Um, but uh, we didn't divide into zone. We are dividing now into zone with the reopening of the programs. Okay. So with the programs, uh, as the county just uh, give us the guidelines of not keeping more than 10 kids to get in one room. So we are dividing rooms and zone and uh, we want to make sure that we respect the, the guidelines for the 10 uh, kids. Uh, and outside, which we have, um, you know, a parking space, uh, it's where we will put the kids to do a warm up all together, like a little run or something like that. Definitely you have to be creative uh, <laughs> with what you have. I think we are lucky because we have uh, 33,000 square feet of facility uh, and uh, it's never felt overwhelmed so far. Uh, even having you know the retail open, the retail space open, the the bar open, that it's not serving food, but it's open now to drinks. Um, so oh, that's great. Um, and w did you place any limits uh, at any point uh, for age restrictions, uh, or have you been open to to kids uh, since the beginning? No, no, since the beginning, we didn't do any age restriction or area more for high risk. We were asked for, um, so far we're morning are slower. So we're advising people to come in the morning if you are a high risk. So maybe something that we're gonna uh, definitely officialize a little bit more um, to communicate with people that feels uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, no, so far, no, no age limit. Okay. Um, 
Well, let's uh, let's move way far north up to Canada and, uh, and hear uh, how everything's been going for you, Lauren. Um, yeah, uh, for us, it's like a little bit of a different situation just for a bit of background. So BC um, is currently and has been for the last month looking at pretty much single digit cases, new cases per day for the province um, of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, and we're in a town of 20,000 people. We're very close to Vancouver, uh, like 45 minutes away, um, but we're still in a very small community. Um, and it's been going pretty well. We opened um, to all of our opt-in members on the 25th of May for a week to test our systems. And then on the 1st of June, we opened to everyone. So members, punch pass holders and guests um, with our new restrictions. Uh, and we have had, I guess, a positive um, return, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's like very low numbers. It's not exactly financially viable to stick it out like this, uh, but that's okay for the time being. So uh, just to go through some of the stuff. So we followed the guidelines that were put in place and that we were talking about for months leading up to it with, uh, the CWA with you, Garnet, and then with the Climbing Escalade Canada. And then we also, as a province, uh, the BC Gems got together weekly and we made a toolkit um, that we presented to WorkSafe BC, which is uh, the employee safety board, and then also to public health. Um, and we kind of rallied together so that we'd have um, a very similar message when we all opened and also um, that we'd communicate as we opened so we'd be in support of each other as we did it. Um, and yeah, one of the bigger things for us um, that we recognized was that WorkSafe BC had the biggest uh, limits in place and their concern was for employees to be involved in the rules and policy building. Uh, so when we brought staff back, we uh, involved them in the process of making our policies and kind of presented them with some of the options from the toolkits um, and came up with our rules with our employees who came back on and then uh, involved them in the um, orientation video we made. Um, and we've seen really good adherence to those rules, I think partly because of that. Uh, some of the things that we're doing is um, we're in a 10,000 square foot building with the base floor and the mezzanine, and we currently have a 20 person max, uh, or have for the last month um, at a time. And those are in two hour blocks and with 30 minutes of cleaning in between, where everyone gets kicked out, staff clean all the high touch surfaces, but not the climbing holds. And then um, we invite the next crew in and give them their new orientations um, and kind of work our way through that. Uh, and we have a lot of the floor markers and the traffic flow markers. The orientation video is online if anyone wants to see it. Um, and yeah, uh, we put a big rule on kids just until we get these rules running. So that included no kids under nine unless they had a pre-existing membership at the gym. Um, and we have no lead climbing and no change rooms or showers at the moment, um, but we added where all of the lead climbs were, we added top ropes. So there was more um, space for people to move around and to distance within the floor. Uh, we also did not require masks, but pushed really hard on the physical distancing side of things. Um, and we haven't had any pushback on that really. Um, some people do choose to wear masks uh, and some staff choose to wear masks, but um, for the most part, there are not many masks going on in our gym at a time, but very few people at a time. Um, Sorry to interrupt. How, how yeah. does that relate to kind of the general vibe um, just in other businesses at the grocery stores? Is it pretty similar mask wearing um, everywhere? Yeah, I, I would say like, uh, once again, BC got really lucky. Um, when the cases started rising, um, like around mid March, we were on, we were like rising as fast as any other province, like they, the hardest hit provinces in Canada. And then for whatever reason, which I'm not gonna put on us as being that great, but something else went down and we, our caseload just went hugely uh, dropped. And so for 
BC and for Squamish right now, you'd be hard pressed to know COVID was a thing. So I, I think the gym is actually doing still a lot more than many of the other businesses. We're in like a weird bubble at the moment. Um, so we've actually had a little bit of pushback. Um, what I would say is that we had a member survey that we've given out um, now that we've been open for a month to see how people feel. And we've had a few diatribes about how COVID's um, not a concern and why are we doing anything. But um, we've also had a lot of people who are really appreciative of uh, the measures that we have taken and people who actually really like the low capacity, um, the empty gym, the access to everything. Um, and uh, a, a few people who actually really like the booking system too, just because of the accountability of it. Um, a lot of people who don't like it as well. Um, yeah, the, the actual survey results. So we had 25% of the people said it was too uh, little time. So they, they felt like they needed more time in the gym, more than two hours. Um, everyone else seemed pretty happy. And then the biggest concerns uh, by far was bringing back lead climbing. Um, which we are really struggling to figure out how to do right now um, and keep as like good use of space as we ha normally have in the gym. And then increasing the gym capacity was uh, another concern that was high on the list. And then uh, change room access and shower access um, were the other big ones. But 70% of the people said that they loved the new gym experience, like four or five um, out of five on the little scale. And then uh, that was kind of it. So we're going to keep doing that survey monthly and see kind of as we continue to increase what we can offer, um, how people are feeling and keep on pretty much use it the same way that we were thinking of doing it for staff already is uh, getting the feedback and helping that to inform our decisions as to how comfortable our community is with what we're, what we're kind of giving them. Yeah. Yeah, it, you mentioned that you opened, uh, was it for the first week, just to the opt-in uh, members. Yeah. Did you get any pushback uh, from non-opt-in members uh, or any feedback no. on that? We had, a, we had a few people who retroactively opted in, which was kind of funny. We got really lucky with weather. It was rainy that week. Um, so we had a few people who did that, but everyone else like understood. They got it. They were fine with it um from the feedback that i could find uh and the people who did come in for that week like uh really enjoyed the low numbers and getting their orientations done before it opened to the public and kind of having that little vip pass to come in that next week when everyone else is getting stopped at the door to do orientations and make sure they had their new waiver and all of those things uh these people just got to kind of like go through the whole labyrinth and wash their hands and walk into the gym um past everyone else so i think i think it was it seemed like everyone kind of understood um why those why they got what they got and they were appreciative of it so it really wasn't much to offer for people who opted in for 77 days of <laughs> nothing <laughs> so yeah. yeah no that's awesome uh it, it, could you go into uh, your decision to, uh, or your team's decision uh, to not bring back lead climbing from uh, from day one? What were the like particular areas you were concerned about? Um, so from a staffing perspective, um, the staff were a little concerned about adding like an additional um, risk component of something that they would have to maybe step in on if there was poor technique going on or if there's just like an additional risk to mitigate. And the big thing with the way that our facility is set up is that uh, most of the uh, lower angle walls on one side of the gym uh, don't have as much lead climbing availability. And then the steeper wall has a, a lot less top rope and a lot more lead climbing. And the way that we operate is we give out ropes for leading um, and people walk around and lead and then they give the ropes back. Um, so it was either changing the entire system of how we did lead climbing, so it was the same rope so that the ropes could go back up, um, or it's removing a lot of the top ropes that we currently have clipped through draws across that lead wall. So we added about 15 more routes that could be climbed um, at any one time and allow people to distance between where, they're, where they are on the wall. 
So even though it's it's like the big one, it seems like the one that people want back the most, it's really hard to do that and imagine how we can keep uh, people feeling so comfortable with their spacing in the gym and increase capacity. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting point around staff as well. Um, you know, any possible exposure if there's like a rescue situation or like as you said, even just a stepping in and coaching people <laughs> to behave better. Um, all right, and are you? So it sounds like you're also using a check in check out system in in conjunction with your reservation. Um, we so we had it set up for that, but we have actually just opted for the straight. It's we've um, so actually this week we've moved into it's two hour and fifteen minute or two an hour two and a half hour blocks of time with fifteen minutes in between. So everyone gets kicked out in that fifteen minutes, and then the gym gets cleaned and then it opens again. All right. Yeah. Yeah, and. Um... Let's see, I just wanted to remind people, uh, you can throw in any questions you want. We got one question in the question and answer uh, tool, but if you have any questions, uh, just throw them in there and we'll get to that portion um, pretty soon. So uh, just load us up with uh, all the questions you might have. Yeah. Um, I, and yeah, so with uh, with uh, your gym, you said it's about 10,000 square feet uh, and, you, and you do have a mix of bouldering and, and top rope, right? Um, have you seen any difference in, in usage there or traffic to one activity over the other? Uh, no, we, we did a little bit at the beginning. So we also didn't offer belay tests um, for the first three weeks that we were open until once again, our staff having the staff meetings and bringing them all back in and um, kind of, even though we, we knew how we wanted to do it, just bringing them into the conversation to problem solve how to do a belay test and keep physical distance. So we have, we just pass over um, a top rope line with a beater on it. Once they've all set up, they clip into that and then there's like a backup belay happening um, throughout the belay test. Um, and that added, people could go back to the ropes then because we are taking on new members and guest passes. Um, like summer in Squamish is a difficult time uh, for saying no to guests because the only days that you have people in the gym are on rainy days and you need all of the people you can get in the gym on those days. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that opened it up. It was a little bit more on the bouldering side for the first three weeks for people who didn't have belay tests, and then now it's opened up again. Okay. Um, yeah, it, and then uh, remind me, I, I believe you said you you started with a bit of an age limit of nine years old, and uh, that's been lifted now, or no. still in place? It's still in place, and it's, it's like, it's one of those harder ones, actually, because uh, that was one of my goals was to put that one back in. But as, as it goes, when you try new things and you get these opportunities through pandemics, I suppose. Um, but we had a lot of members who really liked that rule. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're, we're, we're just kind of being careful with how we reintroduce kids into the gym. And we are doing, we're gonna be doing camps, very small camps this summer. Um, and it's going to happen in the morning when the gym is closed and then they go outside. We're lucky to have the smoke bluffs here and outdoor climbing uh, like a bike ride away. So the kids will be in the gym in the morning and then outside in the afternoon. But we won't be reintroducing kids who don't have memberships into the gym for uh, quite a while. It's not a big part of our market anyways. Okay. We're like a very members based gym. So. Yeah. And have you had any help uh for policies for those summer camps from uh, the health authorities or government or either help or, or just extra restrictions that are put in place? Not too much, no. Uh, BC has been pretty open um, with the restrictions. We, we have sourced from the school board and local teachers and um, we, we are in contact with our health authority as much as we can and keep sending them everything that we're going to do and kind of checking, is this okay, is this okay, is this okay? Um, and I think that we've done that so much that we've just been kind of um, dubbed the nerdiest business in town and they just don't worry about what we do anymore. They just seem to, it's like, yeah, you're doing fine. You're thinking about this more than anyone else. Keep going, <laughs> which is not a bad place to be, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. Earlier, I, b I believe you had mentioned that a few other businesses around had had uh, inspections and um, gone through a bit of a review, physical review process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, my co-owner uh, owns a couple of other businesses, cafes and restaurants in town. 
and he had his businesses checked by the health authority and asked after those checks, are you going to the climbing gym? And they're like, no, it seems like the climbing gym is fine. <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think up. that's uh, that points. To, yeah, well, feather in your cap up there in BC, but also points to um, it's a great example for for how people can start those conversations and and maintain them. I think especially useful in the in the kind of um, very scary uh, potential reality where we go through cycles of closures. Sounds like BC is on a good trajectory, but um, have a couple different uh, a couple different worrying uh, trends down here in the U.S. that uh, might necessitate that. And then even in one case, uh, just yesterday, it was announced um, in Arizona that there'll be a, 30, a, a minimum 30-day closure for reclosure for gyms. Wow. So a lot of different uh, states have um, started reclosing other businesses. Arizona just is the first one that has included gyms in that mandate. Um, so we'll be monitoring uh, that situation. But I think having those conversations like you are um, up there really puts us as an industry and then also just those individual businesses in, in a really good position to communicate um, our responsibilities uh, as we see them and um, you know what we think is best for our business and our members. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think a big one um, that we focused on when we were talking to our members is uh, the orientation involves us stating where we're getting our data from and where we're getting our rules from and how what's going to inform changes in the policy. Um, so being really transparent on the fact that certain things might not be happening right now, but if the caseload goes up in BC, which it most likely will at some point, um, we are ready to make those changes. Um, and, uh, and the feedback that we got on that was that it feels like we're doing enough, but not too much is like how most of our members feel. Um, and they're happy about that, but yeah, yeah we'll see. Great. We'll just keep our eyes on it. Well, um, I'll move over to the question and answer portion. So thanks uh, you guys for typing in some questions here and uh, keep them coming. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just open this up to whoever wants to jump on it, either either you, Lauren, or you, Tilde. Um, so the first question we have here is around, um, you know, maybe as a percentage, uh, what sort of membership loss you guys experienced uh, through the closures um, and then as you reopened? And then maybe more positively, if you've been getting new members, maybe you've had a, a, a net increase, hopefully. <laughs> um, so yeah, wh how about your experiences with that specific area around membership numbers? Um, for us, it was, we're used to, our summer is always at a deficit. Um, and it's definitely much lower. Our numbers are much, much lower than they normally would be at this time of year. And I think that's actually mostly because people had that opportunity to um, terminate or freeze their memberships prematurely when in March, whereas normally they would keep it with the rain a little bit longer, and then they might just let it kind of slide through the summer. And this time there was a hard stop. Um, we are in a strange position in BC where one of the main ways that we're getting through the pandemic is that we have a wage subsidy if your business is uh, generating less than 70% of its normal revenue. So we, we're not, we haven't even come close to that. Uh, so we're not that worried about it. But if, if business did pick up, we'd be put in a really strange position where uh, we'd be risking uh, increasing our expenses by 45% if we went over 70% of our revenue. Wow. That's, yeah, that's a, a, oh man, that's a, that's a really hard <laughs> decision. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, um, well, it sounds like you're, you're not too close to that. And it sounds also like in summer though, uh, you would typically expect less memberships um, and more of those, more of those guests, um, or those guest visits. Uh, um, and so you said you're open for new memberships. Have you seen uh, any uptick there or what you would have expected or less than you would have expected? That would be kind of normal. Just people moving to town um, mm -hmm. are getting memberships, but uh, no real difference there from other years in terms of how many people are signing up. Yeah. It's a pretty low number. Yeah. And how are you down, doing down in uh, Colorado, Tilde? Um, <laughs> Have your membership uh, numbers stayed I pretty consistent? I have to say that uh, definitely we saw more people freezing the account, which 
normally in the summer will happen that definitely is an increase in percentage in that uh, with people saying that they don't feel comfortable to come back right now they're waiting for the fall uh, but in terms of a number I can definitely tell you that we open up this summer pass and we had a very success turnout so we had um, just to give you numbers maybe 120 people purchasing that so we are very happy with that number and definitely was higher last summer but hey so that was very a great result to get new new people coming in and coming and climbing with masks so yeah definitely i think we saw an increasing of uh, people that froze or freeze or terminate the account but uh not too bad it didn't go that bad this first month yeah well good good to hear and and you said that you've been getting some new members is it a pretty similar mm-hmm. situation uh, as lauren described it's yeah some new folks moving in or do you see uh any any other reasons for for new memberships I think the the summer pass it's very uh, a great deal right now and uh, I think that for us it's not a transition as much but people try to get the deal of uh, okay. no paying initiation fee I think uh, those are usually we try to convert those numbers by September uh, so in a great, great percentage converted with us so yeah so pretty good um. Let's see. I've got another question here, uh, and this, this would be an interesting one with uh, with your situation with that subsidy, Lauren. Uh, around whether you've considered raising any prices uh, this year to account for the, the lower lower average turnout, and I might even broaden that if you guys have any other creative pricing models you've been thinking about, um, rather than just like a, a strict raise of prices across the board. <laughs> uh, so uh, right now we are not thinking about that uh, specifically on membership uh, probably uh, it depends how around programs if school are going to reopen or not I think some membership might change for kids or we can get created around that to create more programs in the morning but now we are not thinking of incre- increasing the price right now. Yeah. Us, us, uh, our plan um, before all of this happened was to actually increase our prices in the fall. But we're reconsidering because uh, we need to just see how things go. We need to make sure we keep yeah. the numbers we have. Um, so. Have you guys, either of you, it sounds like both of you have done some member surveying. I don't know if this, if that particular question or any uh, hints around that question were included in, in those surveys, but um, also just in general, like what's your impression of where your members are at? Have you, you see a lot of people who are currently unemployed or are most people working in the types of jobs that have allowed them to stay, um, to, to allow them to keep some wages coming in during uh, the pandemic? I think it's definitely a mix. Um, so far, uh, yes, we saw some termination coming in because people lost their job uh, or, you know, in the motivations, uh, but not that many so far. Um, definitely, we have a lot of people moving <laughs> more than complaining about the cost. Uh, I guess it's because the town where we live, you know, for Collins is a student town. Um, so, yeah, there is a lot of turnover and change of people that comes in. So, so far, we didn't have that problem. So, but definitely we're aware of some people that are uh, definitely in some constraint due to the loss of their jobs. But not that many. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'd say the same. It's it's a mix. Um, mix. Yeah, I I I don't have any strong. We didn't ask that question on our survey. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in general, yeah, I guess we just don't know yet. We won't know until the fall once again. 
Yeah, and uh, I guess if you don't have a higher percentage of people complaining about it, you know, why changing it? Right. Uh, and lowering or hiring the price, I think uh, uh, right now we have to see how the fall is going to go. Um, so we have another question on here <laughs> and, and uh, a very consistent question across a lot of uh, these calls around sanitizing holds and other equipment. Um, you know, we talk about the, the hold side of things um, pretty explicitly in the CWA's reopening guidance. And I know a lot of gyms have their own uh, individual policies that they've written as well, but uh, I would definitely refer a lot of you guys to that document for holds specifically. Uh, we also just added another section uh, last week on uh, root setting operations, and we cover some of the best practices for hold washing and stripping holds off the walls, um, which is more around protecting um, or mitigating risks to your employees rather than to the customers. So just other areas to consider. But so I, I might broaden this question away from the hold side of things, because I think we've covered that on a lot of calls. And um, yeah, just maybe have you guys talk a little bit about any of the increased cleaning uh, that you're doing either for rental equipment or just for the general facility. And I believe, uh, I'm gonna start with you, Lauren, because it sounds like you're doing a, a closure between climbing blocks to allow for that deep cleaning to happen on a really regular basis. Yeah, we, we have a checklist of high touch surfaces, uh, not including the climbing holds. Um, that we go through and make sure that they are um, like so cubby holes and railings and the washroom um, and those things that happen between each climbing block just to kind of mitigate obvious risks of where people are touching. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, we are doing like deep cleans at the end of every night. So um, the training room is a hard one. You can't really clean every single weight and be clean uh, in 15 minutes between sessions. But we do a brush over and we monitor the people who are using the training room to make sure they're washing their own stuff or sanitizing their own stuff after use. Um, and then at the end of the night, we do a deeper clean of the whole room. Yeah. Yeah. And how are you doing down in uh, Colorado with cleaning till day? <laughs> that, uh, I think that we were doing exactly we're doing exactly the same. It's just that we are not doing the blocks anymore. Like we don't have the, the people don't leave. They continue to climb. We clean around them because they don't touch any other service while they climb, they just touching climbing holds. Uh, so we, to help the staff increasing and fo uh, cleaning and focusing on surface that are touched more often, we taped different colors the surface by importance like with the orange tapes those are the things that you have to clean every time or every two uh, we have like every two hours deeper clean and uh, uh definitely now without the blocks we take more time to clean so because we are we don't have the pressure of hey the next block is coming in but it was working. I absolutely think that Lauren, you're doing the right thing. It was working, but um, it's just that maybe because our gym is super big and uh, um, allows us to have people more spread and easy to clean. Yeah, and how, how have your staff uh, been doing with all of these increased duties and tasks? Uh, I imagine like from on the first day, they were like gung-ho and like, all right, we're in this together. Have you seen any complacency or changes in attitude over the last month? I have to say absolutely not. Okay. Uh, there is, mm, that it was a, an easy understanding that that's what's going to change, right? Uh, in the, the duties and the job that they were doing before. Uh, so I have to say that we are really pleased with the stuff that we have right now. It's definitely, uh, there are no slow times anymore. <laughs> so people are moving all the time, So which is great. So. Yeah, I'd say the same. I'd say that uh, I, I actually think my staff really like the lack of slow times, like the, like with the blocks especially is having those like prescribed every two hours you're, you're cleaning and you can focus on just the like the risk management between sessions and being able to switch back and forth. Um, we did look at moving into an ongoing check-in, check-out system. 
Um, and we did get pushback from our staff on it, um, who were really concerned about being able to properly clean uh, like cubbies and things like that, um, and spraying sanitizer near um, guests. So we, <laughs> they, they like they really enjoy being part of the conversation, <laughs> um, and that's great for now. We can we can work around that. And once again, we're kind of testing everything through the summer and seeing if at the end of the summer we're going to need more restrictions or if we can continue to kind of stage back and uh, go back to the old normal. Uh, it's funny, it's funny that you say that the staff said that because the staff for us did the opposite, right? They were happy to walk away from the pre-registrations and the blocks and they wanted to, uh, they felt better that way. So totally opposite experience. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think and and customers, I'm sure, have a variety of opinions on reservations. You mentioned that uh, in in general, people are enjoying the <laughs> the free range they have now. They might not have normally had on a busy, crowded, rainy day up in uh, up in BC. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, we did have like only like two or three of these, so it's not really something to pull from. But um, people who are gung ho to pay more to continue the reservation yeah. system uh, because it was worth it for them. Uh, and then there's a whole other whack of people who really don't like planning at all. Yeah, I, I really imagine that, um, I mean, just also from my own personal experience, because I've, I've enjoyed <laughs> uh, the reservation system and uh, having a little little more elbow room on a, uh, you know, a busy Colorado gym night. Um, but I, I really imagine, like, especially in cities with a good number of gyms, that'll end up being, a, you know, people will latch onto that as a business model uh, just going forward. Um, it, it seems inevitable. <laughs> uh, which is a great segue to our uh, last question that we have time for and the last question here in our window, uh, which is going to be a really hard one for you guys to answer. So um, I'll, I'll let you guys take your best shot at it. And I'm sure it's a question that we'll be revisiting, um, you know, in, in – probably several future webinars and different articles. Um, it's, it's a big, um, a big hard question, but you know, where, where, what are your current attitudes towards long-term uh, sustainability? Uh, you know, this might go on for a year or even two years potentially, um, really unknown, right? I, where do you, where do you, it, <laughs> How, how viable do you think what you're doing right now is over that period of time, a, a year, or maybe even two years? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> uh, I have no idea. That's like a, it's, we have to see what happens in the fall. Um, and the best strategies that I think are gonna work are to forecast madly. So um, get a really, really comfortable and up close with spreadsheets and what happens for us it's what happens if the wage subsidy doesn't get renewed and what happens if um if like the pandemic gets worse and the government stops helping as much as they have or what happens if they keep helping or what happens if we get another loan and how long does that take to pay off and what is like kind of every projection we're trying to run looking at five or ten years of what happens uh, within the market as well. Like what happens if everyone loses their job? No one is going to afford a membership anymore. Um, and then the longer that we can all stay in open communication on what's working and not working and sharing the beta on it, the better off we are all going to be. There's no, I think the more climbing gyms that can survive this, the better it's going to be for the industry. So it's um, like the BC gyms, for instance, uh, a bunch of us opened and it was like, well, do we stop these calls? Like no, even if the pandemic's gone, let's keep going. Like we can, we can all keep using this. This is a very important forum. That was like the more that we can keep that stuff going and keep the conversation going, the higher the chances are we're going to make it through and be able to figure it out. Yeah, I definitely feel the same, and the uh, the fact that the virus acts so differently all over the country definitely make it challenging to understand what's going to happen. Uh, so, uh, so far, I guess this first month was not enough to give us a clear answer on what is going to happening. Uh, 
uh, and if we're going to be sustainable, so far we are, uh, but we have no idea how the next few months are going to plan out for us. Um, definitely a big facility, big expenses, so definitely in, uh, something that we are concerned about it, but um, so far we have been a great support, but we don't know. We absolutely don't know. Um, and we need to continue to keep those calls and uh, talk about it. And I think uh, I think the incredible job that we all been doing, it's showing. And uh, in every day, I think we should focus on, you know, day by day to improve the quality of uh, what these all changes uh, are. And, uh, and I think we are doing that. And we have a great community. Uh, client members are being so supportive, most most of them. And uh, as long as we continue to create connections with our members and explain it and figure it out, so we don't. <laughs> no, I think it's okay. an awesome comment. Yeah, thank you, Tilde. And I, I, yeah, it really is a testament to the, the community that we have as an industry. Um, that it, Amazing. You know, yeah, frankly, a lot of other associations like ours don't have people collaborating like this. Uh, they don't have uh, awesome people like you joining us on calls like this with uh, great attendees. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, we'll keep, uh, yeah, at least from uh, from our end, we'll keep we'll, we'll keep trying to keep everyone connected and, and working together. Um, and we'll also be, uh, you know, uh, on our task of giving you guys actionable information as well. So uh, our, our webinar next Tuesday will cover um, some ideas around uh, youth programming uh, with a couple of um, awesome coaches who've worked with uh, the CWA and uh, some of you guys, I'm sure, um, throughout the years uh, from the Headwall Group. Um, to help us prepare for that survey, we want, we want to hear from you and, and get some input on, um, or to, to help prepare for that webinar, we wanted to hear from you guys and uh, see, you know, where some of your practices are, what kind of questions you have on your mind. So uh, in preparation for that call next week, if you guys have a moment to go to climbingwallindustry.org slash youth dash survey, uh, that'd be awesome. Uh, we'll use uh, the responses from that survey to help shape that conversation so we can just uh, start from the very beginning with um, your most pressing questions. And then uh, the following Tuesday on July 14th, we'll have a, at our same regular time, we'll have a webinar uh, panel discussion with a lot of the root setting professionals who've helped shape the new root setting guidance that we just launched last week. Um, so you can go to reopen, um, to our reopening uh, roadmap website and uh, you know, get a glimpse of those uh, uh, helpful hints that they have. Uh, there's uh, practical considerations in there around just the physical act of root setting, and there's also some great ideas around um, the customer experience and what um, people who are returning to climbing are uh, going through uh, from the customer side. Um, and just a reminder again, <laughs> uh, another survey that we had, as I mentioned earlier, is our reopening survey. That's open just for a really limited time. So um, if, if you guys have the time to go and fill that out, it'd be a massive help. Um, and those monthly surveys, I think, will really help us track uh, the economic impact, the uh, operational impact that uh, everyone's experiencing, and really monitor the situation as an uh, industry as a whole. So uh, that, that's a really important survey, and uh, thank you in advance for <laughs> uh, taking the time to do that for us. It'll really help. Um, and uh, just to echo what Tilde said earlier, you know, thank you guys. Uh, these calls have been uh, so useful for so many uh, owners and operators out there, and uh, it's been really enjoyable for uh, Laura and myself and the rest of the CWA staff to, uh, to see us all come together like this.